Good evening, everyone. Boa noite. How are you all doing? So, welcome back to the series Brazil 200 Years of Independence, History, Language, and Culture. Uh, this series uh, of workshops and presentations and discussions uh, is presented by the Embassy of Brazil in Bridgetown and the Barbados Language Center, Barbados Community College. My name is Marco Schamlefel. I'm a lecturer. I teach Portuguese at the Barbados Language Center uh, at Barbados Community College. So the topic this week is food and food from the northeast of Brazil, from especially from a state called Bahia. Uh, and as you see there, the title is It Has Been the, the History and Elements of Bahian Cuisine. Uh, the person presenting today is teaching right now so and he cannot be at two places at the same time so we had a conversation earlier uh, that was uh, recorded a presentation a conversation and his presentation uh, i will play this uh, recording and afterwards you will have time to ask questions or to comment okay so i will play uh, this recording that was recorded earlier and at the end of the session you will have a chance to ask questions. OK, so enjoy the session of today is a journey into the food of the state of Bahia in Brazil. Mm -hmm. OK, good evening, everyone. Boa noite. Uh, how are you all? Welcome back to the series Brazil 200 Years of Independence, History, uh, Language and Culture. Uh, this week's topic is it has been the, the history and elements of Bahian Cuisine and it has been there is presented by Sean Samar. He's currently a PhD candidate in cultural studies and an adjunct lecturer in communication studies and Brazilian studies at the University of the West Indies, St. Augustine campus. Uh, he is a Caribbean Brazilianist and he has studied at USP, which is the Uni Universidade de São Paulo, and engaged uh, Brazilian culture since 1999. Uh, he was one of the co-founders of A Alma Brasileira, a concert series in Trinidad and Tobago that mentored local artists to perform Brazilian music there. His uh, PhD uh, work focuses on the social cultural conditions that impact the work, the work of music composers who create music for carnivals in Trinidad and in Salvador, Bahia. Welcome, Sean, how are you? I am good, Marco. Thanks for having me. Great. So uh, today you will be presenting on Bahia and cuisine. And uh, can you explain to the public briefly uh, why are you a specialist on Bahia and cuisine and, and <laughs> uh, your experience in Brazil apart from studying at the University of, of Sao Paulo? Yeah, um, well, I've been to Salvador many times, many, many times. Um, and my latest uh, time there was in 2020, right before COVID actually. I spent um, four months there doing some field work for my PhD. Um, from the first time I visited Salvador in 1999, I was just totally um, taken by, by the energy and the culture of the place. And so I've always maintained very close links and friends and colleagues um, in the city. So I guess that you know, visiting many, many times and, and actually experiencing the culture firsthand um, kind of gives me a little bit of credibility. <laughs> right. And as we also saw in this series previously, uh, you may all remember Salvador is where uh, the colonization by the Portuguese started and where the horrific also uh, uh, enslavement and uh, trafficking started, where the sugar cane plantation system started. And we also saw that uh, Salvador and the Northeast in general are the, in quotes, the most Afro-Brazilian places that have the biggest influence of African culture, so Afro-Brazilian culture in uh, Brazil. Obviously, it's all over Brazil, but especially in those areas, especially in, in Salvador, having so many things in common with your country, Trinidad and Tobago, and also mm -hmm. the Caribbean in general. Okay, so you have a presentation. I will hand over to you to present. And um, I may interrupt you, we may ask you some questions if the need arises, but it's over to you. Definitely, thank you. All right, so the presentation today, of course, is meant to be a sort of 
um, overview of the cuisine um, of this region, uh, specifically centered around uh, the city of Salvador, but the wider Bahian region. So I'll hope to just give um, an overview of some of the history and the, um, the the various cultural elements that have contributed to this cuisine. And then I will uh, touch on some of the most famous dishes um, or cuisine items of cuisine that have come out of this region that typify the region, yeah? Um, so that to start, um, I look at a brief history of Salvador and um, Marco talked about, uh, about some of it. So I, I guess it would have been touched upon in previous sessions. Um, I'll say why, you know, what is the cu cultural significance of Salvador? Talk a little bit about religious practices and how they connect to cuisine very intimately in this region. And then, as I mentioned, some of the key dishes of Bahian cuisine. So originally this region was inhabited by indigenous peoples like most of, of Brazil, the Je and Tupinamba peoples, but it was claimed for Portugal by Pedro Alvarez Cabral in 1500. And the name of the uh, area actually uh, came when Amerigo Vespucci landed in this area around 1501 on November 1st, which is uh, in the Catholic religion, the day of all saints. And so he gave the bay, this huge bay that characterizes Salvador, the name Bahia de Todos os Santos, the Bay of All Saints, which it continues to have up until this day. Um, like Marco said, Salvador da Bahia became the seat of colonial government of Portuguese America for a long time, up until the Portuguese uh, monarchy uh, moved to, to Brazil and then shifted the seat of government to uh, Rio de Janeiro much later on. Um, also, like Marco said, the economy of this area started with uh, Brazil wood, Pau Brasil, but then, of course, with the advent of sugarcane and sugar plantations, that became the dominant economic factor for the region. What that means is, of course, uh, the presence of significant African enslavement. Uh, the introduction of white scale sugar plantations meant that um, because the Portuguese had already had a footing in West Africa, uh, they, they began. Um, human trafficking of West Africans to the Brazilian coast um, for the exploitation of Africans as enslaved labor. The region, which is known as the Hekonkovo Bayano or the Bahian Hekonkovo, received uh, more enslaved beings than, than any other port in the Americas at this time. Uh, it's estimated by slavevoyages.org, it's in excess of 1.2 million Africans that were brought to Salvador from 1514 to 1866. So, uh, just the sheer number of people um, will then obviously translate into the impact of the culture that they would have brought with them. Salvador today is known as Black Rome, um, and Travel Noir calls it the cradle of, of Brazil's Afro-Brazilian heritage and also the Black Mecca of Brazil. Um, as I mentioned in the last slide, the vast numbers of Africans trafficked to this area made the area a bastion of African culture because uh, it was a continuous flow of Africans coming into this space. Today, over 80% of the population in Salvador identifies as Black or of African descent. Um, and of course, because of the length of time that African enslavement occurred um, in this space, uh, the renewal or the continual injection of African culture into the space kept um, the, the legacy of African culture very fresh, um, more so than in any other space in the Black Atlantic in the Americas, and obviously shaped the Brazilian way of life and culture in many, many complex ways. Interestingly as well, Professor Rian Gilliam, um, who's an anthropologist, also talked about much later in Brazil's history in the 1930s under President Julio Vargas, just Julio Vargas, sorry, um, that the government started to think about this region as, um, well, obviously being a, a bastion of African culture, but but deciding to use that strength, I guess, or that characteristic, that identity, um, to promote the region um, in a particular way. Interestingly, this geographically, this area, um, besides the Bahia de Todos os Santos, it has a long coastline, which means that there's a lot of contact with the sea. 
um, which of course uh, plays a big influence in terms of the culture, the lifestyle, and definitely the cuisine. So that Afro-Brazilian heritage affects almost every aspect of culture in this, um, in this area, this part of Brazil specifically. So let's talk a little bit, let's turn to talking about cuisine specifically, right? And the link between religion, culture, and Bahian cuisine. Of course, uh, one of the most important things to underscore is that what took place in this space, the Hikonkabu Bayano, was a culture of encounter, right? Um, and, and what we in cultural studies uh, call cultural amalgamation, the uh, clashing of multiple cultures, which will then um, mix and mingle and give, and give way to other forms. Indigenous peoples who were here from the beginning interacted and mixed with Portuguese settlers willfully in many cases and by force in some. Africans, of course, were brought, as, as mentioned, um, as in slave labor. And on the plantations, um, they would have also been very present and very dominant um, in terms of kitchen, um, kitchen staff and, and preparing meals, etc. And of course, Portuguese settlers would have brought um, their own cuisine and their own ideas around um, taste and food, and of course, ultimately, would have been the arbiters of culture, deciding on on what would have been good and and not so good, etc. So the first uh, influence I want to look at is, of course, African religious traditions and food, because of its its significance and presence in this area. Most Africans, as I mentioned were brought and trafficked from Angola, uh, which is Southwest Africa and a little higher in terms of West Africa between Benin and Nigeria. And that region has an average of over 200 Odishas that are worshiped. Um, Candomblé, which is very present today in Salvador and similar traditions can have a very strong footing and are considered to be syncretic because they incorporate many West African traditions, but they've also incorporated um, other traditions that they encountered in the Brazilian space, such as Catholicism, um, some indigenous beliefs, etc. And so it's considered to, to have been a religious tradition that is created from many different traditions, but created in the Bahian space. Uh, when we talk, sorry? yes. Uh, can you, obviously it's obvious for the two of us what Orishas mean, can you briefly explain what is an Orisha for the ones that don't know? Sure, no problem. Um, an Orisha is uh, basically an, a divinity, um, an African divinity. So um, in many, like many other religious traditions around the world, they take quasi-human forms or characteristics. So sometimes they might be male, female, um, they may be uh, responsible for or in charge of particular elements of nature, um, that kind of thing. But they are basically uh, deities worshipped um, in, originally in West Africa that were brought to the Americas. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Um, so the, the practice called Candomblé, which is one of the, the dominant African religious traditions in Salvador, would not exist without food. Um, as, it, as food is the element of communication between us humans and Odishas. And what do I mean by the elements of communication? Basically, in all of the worship of Odishas in Candomblé, food is prepared in a particular way, following particular traditions, um, and then offered to the Orisha as um, a way to create a connection between our material world and the spiritual worlds. And so that's why it's a form of communication. Um, of course, understanding that uh, the, the bringing of these traditions in terms of preparation and, and which foods um, pertain to which Orishas is a good example of what we call food mobility, the, the culinary practices of one religion um, including the types of ingredients used, etc., um, moving from one geographic space to the next, in this case, from the African continent to the Americas. And this image um, is an example of uh, what is called Comida de Santos. So the food that is prepared 
um, that is understood to appeal to and to appease particular Orishas. Um, and so they are prepared usually um, when, it's, when it is time to have rituals uh, dedicated to these particular Orishas so that um, it establishes a means of connection between the material world and the spiritual world. And the interesting thing about this is that these exact same foods, um, according to Patricia Rodriguez de Souza in her work, Food in Africa and Brazilian Candomblé, she said that food in Candomblé can be understood as a language, not only because it conveys messages, but because it follows strict grammar. And by grammar, she means that there are specific ways that the foods should be used, how they should be used, why they should be used, and who can actually use them. Right? It's all part of the rituals and ceremonies, but it has sacred dimensions uh, in terms of how it's used in the rituals, and it also has profane dimensions. So these exact same foods are used in the daily life um, of Bahians, basically. And the only difference between the food eaten on a regular day or on the street and the food used in a Tejero kitchen, for example, a Tejero being the space where candomblé rituals are, are enacted. Um, the only difference between the food in a Tejero and the food on a given day is basically how it's prepared, the rituals behind preparation, which it is believed transforms the food from just being everyday food to being comida de santo or a saint's food. Yeah? And so each Orisha has its favorite food. And on the day of that particular Orisha, it's celebrate that the Orisha is celebrated, people eat that particular food. And dishes have changed over time, depending on uh, things that ingredients that were available or not. Um, and so there have been changes, but there have been some consistencies in terms of ingredients, like the use of palm oil, dendi oil, dried shrimp, okra, beans, onions, coconuts, uh, manioc flour, corn, cassava, and peppers tend to be consistently used in, um, in these dishes. So Sean, I, I yes. just uh, underline here because you mentioned palm oil and you said dende oil. Uh, yes. That is why he has the word dende in the title of his presentation, which is the palm oil, right? So just uh, exactly. reinforcing. Yes, thank you. Um, what African culture did was bring to the European settlers table um, some ingredients that would not have been um, an, an essential part of, of Portuguese cuisine, for example. So things like chili pepper, um, okra, which is originally from the African continent, and of course, dende oil, palm oil, um, would have been uh, some of the key ingredients that were introduced into uh, Portuguese cuisine, which then morphed into these new creations that are now considered Brazilian cuisine um, and became adaptations of some of these sacred foods of the Orishas that we talked about. Another researcher, Arani Santana from Casa do Benin, um, said that Africans enhanced the flavor of the dishes by adding palm oil, then the oil in almost everything from mokekas to shinshin chicken. And anytime there was extra oil, they would then use it in the farofa or to make fried plantain. And we'll talk about farofa a bit later on. Um, the use of coconut milk a lot in, in stews and marinades, for example, was also an African addition. Um, and then after the coconut had been ground to get to extract coconut milk. The the uh, ground coconut would then be used to make cocada, which I'll also touch on a bit later on, uh, combining the coconut with sugarcane molasses, etc. And many times when broth was left over from stews, Portuguese stews, they could be mixed with indigenous uh, manioc or cassava flour and turned into a succulent mush. It's very clear that Africans became Africans who were enslaved in the Brazilian context became very adept at utilizing everything that was around um, to create new and interesting things um, that were inspired by, by, by dishes that were part of their culture already, um, but they just found ingenious ways 
to utilize whatever materials uh, were available in this new space they were introduced into. Uh, interestingly, uh, for those of you who might be interested um, in going to Salvador and experiencing some of these things yourself, there is uh, an, an institution, I guess, called Sinaki, which is um, sort of like a training institution for young people. And there's an element that um, does hospitality and uh, gastronomy training, and they have a museum of Bahian gastronomy that you can visit. Um, in the Lago do Pelourinho principal, uh, principally, which is in the center of the old town. Um, there you can see exhibits. There's a suite and bookshop. There's a bar. And one of my favorite elements of this particular space in Lago do Pelourinho is um, the restaurant, which has a, what they call a typical buffet every day. Um, it's considered to be one of the best buffets in the country, and it really is one of the best buffets in the country. They have over 40 dishes um, at lunchtime. And it is said that these 40 dishes, most of them are the same replications of the food that would be created for the Odishas in, in candomblé ceremonies. Um, so it's over 40 dishes plus tons of desserts and for a really great price and between 65 and 75 hairs. Um, for all you can eat buffet kind of thing. It's amazing. So if you ever go to Salvador, definitely check it out. So this is for your references about 15 US dollars. Right. The price, right? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's very, very affordable. The other interesting um, influence in Bahian cuisine, um, which brings in some indigenous elements and some Portuguese traditions, uh, is connected to their, the food surrounding their Festa Junina. Um, and the Festa Junina was brought by the Portuguese. Um, it was based on festivals that honored uh, three particular Catholic saints in, in June, St. John, St. Peter, and St. Anthony. Uh, prior to Catholicism or the reign of Catholicism in Portugal, these festivals were um, festivals that celebrated the sun. And then later on during Roman times, the goddess Juno, but with, with Catholicism, uh, they were dedicated to the, the three saints that I mentioned above. These June celebrations, which are popular across Northeastern Brazil, not only Bahia, but um, also very strong in Bahia, um, were already celebrated in Portugal uh, before, and, and they brought some of the foods that were part of that celebration, most of them using wheat and cereal, but of course, wheat was not being produced uh, in, in this region during colonial times at all and not part of Brazilian agriculture. So substitutes were found. Corn, which is uh, the primary substitute because it is native to the Americas and is also harvested around this time in June, started to be used um, to create some of these dishes or um, dishes inspired by the original Portuguese dishes. And of course, the use of corn um, having been very much connected to indigenous cuisine um, started to be become a central part of these Festa Junina celebrations. So we see some pictures of the elements of the, of the dishes that will be used here. All right, any questions, uh, Marco, before we go on to look at specific dishes? Uh, no, no questions, Sean, but a comment. As you sure. already said, your focus is obviously on Afro-Brazilian cuisine for a good reason. But as yes. you were showing there, and this is syncretic Brazil, mm -hmm. not syncretic in the sense of of, uh, of beliefs, but syncretic in the sense of mixes. Uh, yes. You get uh, the mixture of Amerindian traditions like the corn, uh, mm -hmm. Portuguese traditions, and obviously in the area of Salvador, heavy uh, African influence. But this is uh, Brazil. It's a fusion mm -hmm. of European, Amerindian, and African cultures, as we saw already in this series, and as we still will see in other presentations, even the things that are not related to food at all. But mm -hmm. uh, those three elements always come come up. That is interesting. Yes. Yeah. That's my yeah. comment. Thank you. And we'll see it in the food as well. Um, and of course, it, I think food is such a universal language that um, it's hard to kind of keep cultural influences isolated. They, they start to intermingle and they, they, 
influence and impact one another to create these amazing uh, dishes that are now characteristic of Brazil and characteristic of that inter intersection and intermingling of, of these various cultural influences. And you even get uh, those indirect influences. If you look, for example, the Spanish music or the Spanish cuisine, the Portuguese music, the Portuguese cuisine, you get mm -hmm. the influence from Northern Africa because the Moors, they mm -hmm. colonized the Iberic Peninsula for 800 yes. years. So yes. indirectly, we get all that. So they, the whole world comes together uh, yes. when it comes to food in terms of culture. That is a uh, fascinating yeah. Sorry mm -hmm. for interrupting you again. No, 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 it's okay. It is. I mean, when it could, yeah, there's certain elements of culture that just do not, they they don't allow for segregation, you know? Um, it just all comes together um, in the interest of making really good tasting food. <laughs> so the first dish I want to touch on, of course, um, is a carajé because it is one of the most um, symbolic um, one of the most pronounced, one of the most recognizable dishes from this region. Um, Akaraje is considered to be the most popular street food around in Salvador. It is made from peeled uh, beans, but usually black eyed peas that are then formed into a ball and fried in the same palm oil, dende oil. And usually when you go to a, a bayana, which are the women who sell them on the street, they will split it in half and stuff it with whatever you want in it. Um, on this plate, you're seeing vatapa, you're seeing karuru, you're seeing some salad, and then you're seeing shrimp. Um, and of course, as much pepper as you would like, <laughs> because that's also a tradition coming from the African continent. So you tell them what you want and they put, you know, based on, on your preference. Um, yeah, it's, as I mentioned, it's sold by these bayanas um, because this food originally was dedicated to the Orisha Yasa or Oya, as is known in some other parts of, of the uh, Black Atlantic. And it, it has, it's a relative to some of the other elements of cuisine that we know of. So for example, in Trinidad, we have something called Accra. It's pretty much uh, along the same lines, they're cousins. And in West Afri Africa, there's something called Akara, which is again, a cousin to the Akaraje. So we see the kind of, um, cultural continuity um, in that sense. I just wanted to mention um, that this tradition of the Bayanas selling a Karaje is um, really well understood and, and well underscored in Salvador. I mean, to the point where there's a, a memorial to the Bayanas uh, that sell Akaraje. It's a space dedicated to the history and the tradition of these Bayanas. And the memorial was inaugurated in Salvador's historic center in 2009. And it's because many of the women who, uh, who dress in these traditional clothes and sell this as their occupation, basically, uh, many of them were single mothers who manage their own households. And there is uh, there's an idea that even during uh, times of enslavement, uh, women who sold a carajé on the streets of Salvador were allowed by their masters to keep some of the money that they made. Um, today, anybody can't become a Bayana. Like, they're unionized, they're registered. Um, it's it's very organized um, because they want to represent their interests in a particular way, and because there is a an understanding of the, of the way to do it. It's not anybody could just make a karaoke, um, but it represents a good example of how African influences have contributed and shaped Brazil's cultural heritage and identity. One of the uh, one of the elements that goes into a karaoke is karuru. And this is a, a really, really African dish um, because it's made of okra, dried shrimp, onions, uh, toasted nuts, and of course, cooked in the dende palm oil. Um, it's traditionally traditionally consumed with akaraje, but it can be consumed apart. It's said to be a favorite of Shango, the Yoruba uh, Orisha fire, but it's also um, used in syncretic celebrations, for example, like the September festivities honoring the saints Cosme and Damiel, the twin saints, and uh, Saint Barbara. And this dish is actually traditionally served to guests as a sign of celebrating 
family relationships or friendship as well. The other element that sometimes goes with acarajé, if you want, is vatapá, um, one of the most famous Brazilian dishes made with um, stale bread, so old bread, fish or shrimp, depending on what you have, coconut milk, manioc flour, of course, palm oil, as we're noticing is in everything, and cashew, cashew nuts. And you can eat this dish with acarajé, yes, but you can also eat it with white rice. It's also really nice with just plain white rice. It's, I think it's absolutely amazing, but I guess it's a matter of taste. Farofa ji dende, which is uh, said to be of African origin, not necessarily the farofa because that's cassava, which is, it comes from cassava, which is native to the Americas, but the tradition of, of making it like this um, is well known by all those who like Bahian food. And it usually goes in lots of things from moquecas to feijoada to, any number of things. Um, there are three basic ingredients that have to be in a farofa ji dende. Onions, finely chopped, cassava flour, manioc flour, and of course, palm oil. But people add things according to their taste. Some people put peas or beans, some people put bacon. What do you put, Marco? <laughs> in farofa. I add anything possible, but I like, I like bacon, butter, yeah, uh, right. eggs, uh, parsley. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but farofa, farofa is, a, is a democratic dish. You can choose what you like and add to the roasted cassava flour. And Thanks. you know what is interesting, Sean? I don't uh -huh. know if you know, I lived for two years in Accra, in Ghana. Okay. And to my surprise, uh -huh. I found there something called gari gari. And gari okay. gari is more or less our roasted uh, cassava flour. And it's a form of farofa that they add to their dishes. Wow, interesting. I wonder so this if is again, a, this is the other way around, you know, the influence. Yes, exactly, yeah. It's it's something that was probably created in, in Brazil that, that then found its way back to the continent. That's really interesting. Exactly. Nice. It's a two-way flow, right? <laughs> uh, another is, uh, yes. dish is acasa. Um, acasa is a traditional Afro-Brazilian dish. Um, that is very important um, in the rituals of candomblé, but it's basically um, a thick kind of mush-like dish that is made from ground white corn that's soaked and pounded and then wrapped in banana leaves. Um, and then it's served with a kind of sauce to give it flavor because it's usually very bland. It's just the corn and salt, so it doesn't have its own very strong flavor. Um, so it's accompanied by any kind of sauce that would give it flavor. And there's several uh, very sorry, sorry, yeah. yeah, sorry, my my ignorance. Do you have something like that in Trinidad? Like a casa? No, no. We have um this other one that I'm gonna talk about now, um, abara and pamonia. Okay. We have things similar to those. Yeah. Right. In Barbados, we have the sweet conky that is similar to that. Ah, okay, okay. And it's a dish that is usually eaten during Independence time, but it's sweet and it has corn and is wrapped in a banana leaf and okay. that's really interesting and what is yeah. it called conky 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 okay okay so the abara is a steamed version almost of a carajé. so it's made with the same black eyed peas mashed into a paste but then steamed rather than fried in dende oil um, and usually you eat this at room temperature. And uh, if you have a taste for pepper, it usually goes really good with hot pepper sauce. The moqueca bayana um, is considered to be uh, one of the kind of landmark dishes. It's a seafood stew. So of course I mentioned Salvador having so much coastline and, and being uh, you know, on that huge bay by Yeji Todo Sustanto, so there's always a lot of access to seafood. Um, this seafood stew usually has fish, shrimp, and any other seafood you'd like to put in a crab, etc. Um, coconut milk, of course, then the oil, lime juice, and a bunch of vegetables. So red and yellow sweet peppers, tomatoes, onions, garlic, and sometimes ginger. And you eat this with rice and farofa. Um, and this dish is actually, even though there's a, a significant African influence with the dende oil and the coconut milk, et cetera, it, it's considered to be actually an original indigenous 
dish. Um, and over time, the, the African influence was added to it um, to make it the Mokeka Bayana. Bobo de Camarão, again, is another dish that has um, some indigenous influence, but it is a kind of stew as well, um, made with pureed cassava, fresh shrimp, coconut milk, and dende oil. And the word bobo actually comes from the Eo people who came from Africa to Brazil, because initially um, th that denotes a dish made with beans, and maybe initially there were beans in it, but it's not made with beans anymore. Um, and usually you have this with rice on the side and, and fat off if you want as well. Very common in many uh, Bahian restaurants. Couscous de milho, um, consumed by many Brazilians as a breakfast food, but uh, people in Salvador, Sotero Politanos, love it. Um, <laughs> and it was considered to be originally a food consumed by the enslaved and poor people, but now it's, you know, anybody eats, eats it. Um, it's really cornmeal seasoned with salt and steamed. You can add coconut milk and you can add sweeteners if you want it to be sweet. Um, but it's a, a very popular breakfast food. The first time I saw it, I, I was a little confused because we don't have anything close to it, especially as a breakfast food here in the Caribbean. But it's pretty good once you get accustomed to it. <laughs> So that's in terms of some of the main uh, dishes. I want to turn now to some sweets and snacks um, that have also become um, some of the, the landmark things and symbolic of traditional Bahian cuisine. The first one is kinji. Um, it's a traditional Brazilian coconut custard kind of cake made with sugar, egg yolks, and ground coconut. There are lots of theories around its origin. Some say that it was invented in the 17th century in Northeast Brazil by Africans who were enslaved there working in kitchens. But the presence of egg yolks in this particular recipe um, might be a connection to some Portuguese culinary roots because there are lots of, uh, there's a heavy usage of egg yolks in many Portuguese sweets. So it could have some Portuguese uh, origins as well. It's said that the name, the name Kinjing stems from the Bantu language and roughly translated means uh, the gestures of adolescent girls, which is kind of weird, but <laughs> that's what they say. And um, it's really popular all around Brazil now. Cocadas, of course, are these bars made from condensed milk sometimes, sugar, vanilla, grated coconut, definitely. They're found all over Brazil on the streets and bakeries. Um, and there are lots of different variations where you can add toasted coconut or dosed de leche, chopped nuts, etc. We actually do have an equivalent very close to this. In Trinidad, at least, we call sugar cake. Um, and it's made in a very similar way. I, and I think they're probably, this, it's the same, same thing all throughout the region. Same, with different, name, same name in Barbados same, as well. Okay, okay. Yeah. Sugar cake. Sugar cake, yeah. Which makes sense because it's coconut and sugar basically <laughs> with different colors. But I guess this yes. is another, another good example of the use of whatever was available, right? So of course, in, in the Caribbean and in Brazil, being part of this whole sugar industry, sugar was readily available and then coconuts were available and used to get other things like the coconut milk and whatnot. So you the use of the excess ground coconut would have been easy to make this. Beijou? I actually have shown, I uh -huh. have shown a, a little a theory that is uh, unproven, but is my theory. Is uh -huh. why our our desserts in the real world are so sweet, and mm. uh, why the ones in Europe are not as sweet. Uh, right. I guess because the recipes in Europe they were based on beetle. Sugar, which is less sweet than cane sugar, yes. but uh, we adopted kind of the same measurements and yes. used cane sugar instead, and that is why we eat or like to eat things as sweet to the point that it burns in your mouth. Yes, <laughs> pure sweetness. Yeah, but this is an unproven unproven theory. I'm just alleging this. <laughs> I I kind of agree with that, and I and I guess it's the it's the same idea that if you if you are in the, the space where something is produced, 
um, then your access to it, as well as the cost of it, is going to be a lot more, a lot easier than in a space where they have to import it and pay more for it. You know, so exactly. Um, another really popular snack in Salvador is the beiju, uh, also known as tapioca sometimes, and it's a kind of grainy crepe-like flatbread. Um, which you can either put sweet things inside or savory things inside, but it's basically cassava starch that it's moistened, pasta sieve um, so that it can get as thin as possible and then sprinkled on a hot pan. And the heat kind of makes the starch bind together and create this crepe-like formation. Um, sometimes people have it for breakfast. I've had it for dinner in Salvador. There's a restaurant in Baja that just does, this is like their primary thing. And, they make any kind of stuffing you want inside of it. And some of the favorite stuffings are coconut, carnage salt, which is uh, sun-cured beef, and homemade Giulietta, which is a combination of cheese and guava peas, guava jam sometimes. Bolo GIP, which is a, a cake, basically, but like in many, like in Spain and Portugal, cakes, uh, sometimes a part of breakfast. It may seem strange to those of us who come from Anglophone cultures, but this is not uncommon at all. Um, Bolo GIP, which is basically cassava cake, is dense and sweet, made from cassava, um, and usually has coconut and lots of sugar, of course, and can be found anywhere, um, street vendors, supermarkets, bakeries, etc. Mugunza, which is known as canjica in southern Brazil, uh, is a porridge made from corn, um, white corn usually cooked in coconut or regular cow's milk, and can be sweetened to taste, basically. And cloves and cinnamon are sometimes uh, additions to this, a breakfast food mostly. Pomonia, which is the other one that I said we have uh, in Trinidad, we have something similar to this called pimi. Um, but it's it's very similar to the Mexican tamale, um, but with a Brazilian twist, I guess. All throughout the Americas, you'll find corn being used in similar ways. Pomonias are made both sweet and savory. In Trinidad, we call the sweet one pimi, and we call the savory one pastas. Um, but in Brazil, they're, they're both called pamonia. And um, they can be either sweet with coconut and sugars and stuff, or they can be filled with things like cheese and pork, chicken, etc. And so that brings me to the end of the presentation. And to basically say that, you know, Bahian cuisine might have started off as being this uh, unique kind of combination of Portuguese um, and other European influences, not only Portuguese, African and indigenous uh, cuisine traditions, but they have really become just a part of Brazilian culture. And we can find many elements of Bahian cuisine all across Brazil today. Wonderful. So I guess this picture also, Sean, uh, leaves us space uh, for uh, something in the future for you to present about uh, cultural aspects of this area of Brazil, because the the wristbands there they already tell a story that we will not reveal uh, today, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I have a question. So if you could go back tomorrow to Bahia, what would be your plate number one, your first choice to eat? My first thing to eat. Um, definitely a kind of shit. <laughs> that is always like I when I when I go to Salvador and I go to a Bayana to buy a Kalaje, I buy like two or three at a time. I <laughs> I can't just eat one a Kalaje. They're so good. They're absolutely. <laughs> I'm not a fan of the I'm not a fan of the shrimp because they leave the the shell on the shrimp, which uh -huh. for me is just really different. Like, I don't think it's terrible, but it's just different. I, we're so accustomed to taking the shell off here in the Caribbean, but in Salvador, they eat it with the shell. So I usually don't order the shrimp. I just have 
everything else, but a park, karuru, and, and a little bit of pepper, because I'm not really a pepper eater. So, you know. <laughs> yes, so it will be my, my first choice as well. Uh, a yeah. nice acarajé, but I don't I don't mind the, the shrimp and the shells. So I would <laughs> add that as well. <laughs> oh, yes. Uh, OK, fantastic. Uh, uh, Sean, I thank you very much for this uh, lovely presentation. Uh, and we will see what kind of questions people have tomorrow uh, yeah. since this is recorded and uh, I will try to answer them or perhaps later when uh, if there is a question we cannot answer, you perhaps can answer it in the comment session of um, the YouTube uh, recording. Yes. Uh, yes. We will see. So fantastic. Thank you very much. Do you have no. any any comments you would like to make? Any final considerations? Uh, no, I would just like to say that um, for, for me as a Caribbean person, um, the the similarities between our cuisine and our culture in the Caribbean and what you can find in Salvador is so strong that for any Caribbean person who goes to Salvador, I guarantee that you'll feel at home. I guarantee that you'll love the food, you'll enjoy the food. Um, and so I encourage people to visit, definitely. <laughs> yes. Yes, there are a lot of similarities between the Caribbean and, and, and Brazil, especially the North East. Uh, Brazil. Okay, thank you very much, Sean. Uh, we hope to see you in the future here in the series again. Uh, I say bye bye. Thank you. Ciao. Uh, take care. Uh, here I am. I saw that uh, Sonia, you raised your hand. You have a question or a comment regarding this presentation that was recorded and um, previously? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, yeah, sure. Yeah, I it was wonderful. I lived in Bahia for a year in 1977 to 78. I was a student at the Universidad Federal de Bahia, and he just took me down memory lane. And like him, my absolute favorite is acarajé. <laughs> that was my dinner when I had no money as a student. And I would go home on the way and buy the hot acarajé made before your eyes in the hot dendé oil and I would feel I had eaten. So this took me down memory lane. It was wonderful. It covered everything as far as I can see. I was struck by the use of the cassava because we don't use cassava like that. But the farofa and all the other things, you know, I found that it was delicious, different. And I thank you for taking me down memory lane again. That was wonderful. <laughs> Okay. That's, that's great. So, uh, Akarajé seems to be a favorite of all of us then. <laughs> oh, and yes. I actually make it right. here now. I can make it at home now. Yeah. Not like them though. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. I make it here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I try Thank to make Brazilian foods, Brazilian foods in Barbados as well. So, <laughs> I think we all uh, do that uh, once we know about it, right? Uh, yes, and you're right. Cassava is used, is used in a very versatile way in Brazil. We use it uh, as you would use potato, as you would use flour for for baking, for even bread, for a lot of things. So uh, yeah. cassava yeah. is is a staple that is around for you know use use it as flour, you use it as mash, you use it cooked, you use it in stews, and um, yeah. yeah, all possible things. And even Amazing. perhaps uh, obviously Sean did not talk about that. But one famous uh, food we have in Brazil is called pão de queijo, which is cheese bread. And uh, mm -hmm. obviously, cheese bread is not specifically from that area. That's why he did not present it. But but uh, pão de queijo, the cheese bread, the basis of pão de queijo is actually not cheese. It's cassava and some cheese is added to it. But the, the, the basic uh, dough of uh, the pão de queijo is actually cassava as well. Mm -hmm. Tapio so tapioca again. flour. Yeah. Yeah, wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Very well done, very broad, covers most of the things that I remember. I mean, it's a long time ago, but it's still fresh in my memory. Okay, <laughs> thank you. That's wonderful, yeah. And we hope to see you back because our sessions here are weekly. Uh, we discuss a lot of things about Brazil, so including food yeah, as well. I'll be back, <laughs> I'll be back. I'll be surely back, for sure. Thank you. Fantastic. Okay, so uh, do we have any other questions or comments? From the public? 
Uh, Marilani, you raised your hand. Yes, go ahead. Yes, I I did. I well, that's very interesting. His presentation, I learned a lot. But uh, his presentation is only from Bahia. Uh, shame on me. I only know two dishes from Bahia. <laughs> because where I come from, you don't eat any of this dish. I even, anyway, I just know Bobo, the Camarão. Actually, that uh, I, I, I had the first time here in Barbados. And uh, what else? Oh, the kingdom, uh, the sweet stuff. That's the only thing that I know. Oh, I know Pamonia, but in the south of Brazil, you do completely different than they do uh, in Bahia. Just so you see, you are, you are Brazilian, and Brazil is so big, we always have something to learn about our own country as well. Exactly. <laughs> yep. Okay. Thank you for your comment. Any other any other comments? Marcia, yes, go ahead. Marcia, we cannot hear you. Your microphone is open, but we cannot hear you. Hello. Yes, no. You hearing me, Marcos? Yes, yes. Go ahead. Um, I was not hearing part of the of the presentation when he was speaking of the acarajé, but I wanted to ask a question. Was it originated in Africa or was it uh, where where what part of Africa was it originated from? Uh, well, there are a lot of places in Africa that have similar dishes, but none of them is exactly like Akaraje, okay? Uh, the area, the general area where uh, Akara comes from is where Ghana is today, West Africa in general. But uh, as it happened with most of the dishes in Brazil and in our culture in general, uh, we transformed the dish, okay? Uh, okay. And it is unique. It is unique to Brazil. The same is like the black bean stew, uh, which is our national dish, the so-called feijoada. Feijoada okay. existed before in Portugal, right? But in a completely different way. And it was with the contribution of the Africans. I will tell that story. One day we'll have a session just on feijoada and we'll explain that. So it was okay. with the contribution of the African culture that feijoada became Brazilian and unique Brazilian. Uh, so it is a Brazilian dish that has African influences, Portuguese influences. The same as acarajé. It has heavy African influence, but it's a Brazilian dish. Okay. Um, oh. If you actually, actually, this is something for everyone. If you miss the part uh, of this presentation, uh, the recording will be later on uh, YouTube, so you can watch whatever you missed or or rewatch if you if you want. Okay. Any All other right. comments? Yes, any other comments or questions? Hi, good night. Yeah, good night. Charlotte, go Hi. ahead. Yes, I do have a question. Um, here in Barbados, we have sauce, which I understand was created from the fact that the slaves took the scraps of meat and pickled it. I'm wondering if there is a similar version of that in Brazil. Uh, wait for it. That will be exactly the session where I will talk about the national Brazilian dish that was influenced exactly also by leftovers from slaughtered pigs that the enslaved Africans got and that is when they created a new dish. It's kind of similar. It's not pickled, but it has in its backgrounds a lot of uh, similarities. So when I talk about a national dish called feijoada in a future session, that is when you will um, hear about that. Okay, Sonia, you have another? Is that okay, uh, Charlotte? Does that make you happy? Yes, thank you. That's great. Thank you. I look forward to that okay. session. Yeah, yes, um, I Yeah, I just want to let her know that you'll find that in Panama. 
In Panama, you'll find an equivalent to South, okay? But for the year that I lived in Brazil, neither in Bahia or the other places that I went to all over Brazil, I didn't see anything like South, but certainly in Panama, it's there, okay? I guess, Thank it you. Related, I guess it is related to the Barbadians that immigrated to Panama it, to help in the construction sure. of the they canal. There. Yeah, they took it there. What Brazilians use, they lose what they call the dried meat, the kind of salt. Dried meat, and that is the in the, they didn't talk about the real food here, the other food, the feijoada. They use a lot of that dry, dry, dry meat, but it's certainly not, I didn't see the, the you know, pig tail, pig snout thing that we have oh, no. here, but it might be there now. Who knows? Who knows? Uh -huh. Okay. So no, you're, you're right. I don't know. I don't know any dish similar to sows uh, uh, in Brazil, but there are similarities of using like the leftovers, like uh, uh, pig tail, ears, snout, and things like that in Brazilian tradition as well, because of the background of the enslaved getting the leftovers during the horrible time of enslavement. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Yes. Okay. Any other person would like to comment or ask something? If not, so that's it then from us today. Uh, join us next week again. We will have another session on another interesting topic about, about Brazil. So I hope to see you again next week. I say ciao, ciao, goodbye. See you next week. Ciao. Buon Ciao. Ciao, buon Hasta luego. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. I'm hungry. Good night. <laughs> <laughs>